Well, good morning. I made my first few signs using a geometric pattern in the background. I'm going to show you how I did it today on LaserNug. This is actually the second sign now I've made for the same company down in the US. It's a forestry company. So when I started to work on the first logo sign for them, I knew being a forestry company making products for forestry or foresters that I needed to incorporate wood somehow in the sign that I was making for them. The logo, as you can see, is a bull, a big bull, and it's black with blue insets. So I've used a lot of acrylic on that as I did on the first, as well as a few other things I've done for them in the past. So this is in fact the second sign I've done. Same size as the first one, but in this case, I've taken the logo and the brand and they've got a big brand new product launch this month. And so I've incorporated the name of that new product into the sign, but maintaining the same format and appearance as the first sign. This is what the first one looked like. And during my first attempt at trying to do ge geometric patterns, I made quite a number of errors. So today I'll identify those areas or those caution areas so that hopefully you folks won't make the same mistakes when you do yours. Always had an interest in these, what they call mosaic wall art or geometric wall art or different types of patterns with wood. So I did a little bit of research and I realized that although it kind of looks complicated, it's actually a very, very easy thing to do. Just takes some time. In this case, it's a pretty simple design. It's basically one angle for the whole sign. I think if you start to get into the more complex with multiple angles or different slats or pieces of wood going different ways, that gets a little bit hairy. But I wanted to take you through the build just so you could see that it is something simple. And hey, if I could do it, I know for sure you could do it. And what it does, I think, is it gives a lot more character to your design and also allows you to blend the use of acrylics with wood. So I'll take you through today. I've had to speed up a number of different parts, but I'm going to do a narrative over top of it because I, you know, otherwise it would have been a couple hour video. And we're also going to be using standoffs today. I've used them in the past. I'm not sure if you have yet, but once again, it's a really nice way of adding more depth or another dimension to your art or to the signs or the work you're doing for your customers. So stick around and I'll walk you through it. So the name of the company is Logox. They're down in the U.S. They make American-made tools for foresters or for forestry, whether it's professionals or it's folks like you and I. I'm going to incorporate their base logo into Lightburn as I normally would. And although you folks have seen this a number of different times, I'm going to start working on my acrylic pieces. So I'm going to set my layers. As you can see here, I'm engraving pockets in the bull itself. I know a lot of people will score a piece of acrylic so that they know where to put uh, any acrylic on top, any designs or lettering. I just find that I, my hands are not quite as steady as they used to be and my eyes not as good. I have tried scoring pieces before, but I find it's very easy for me to accidentally move a letter or a design piece and not be able to fully catch the score lines before my cement sets. And of course, especially when you're dealing with letters, they need to be oriented specifically or correctly. And if you've got them slightly off camber or disoriented, even the slightest bit, once that glue sets, you can't do anything with it. Kind of similar to using 3M, the same kind of thing. Once you press that 3M down, pretty much impossible to pull it back up and reapply it. Your piece is more or less ruined. Okay, I've got the bull done, all my black pieces, and now I'm going to start working on all of the blue pieces. So I've, of course, always autofocus. I set my origin, I frame it, and then I begin my work. We're going to cut out all of the blue pieces here, including the blue lettering. But in this case, on this blue piece of acrylic, the protective paper on each side is the same, and there's no markings. So quite often what I'll do to make sure I've got the correct orientation especially when I have a lot of different design pieces and different shapes, is I'll just grab a pen and I'll just mark on one side so that I know after it's out on my workbench which side is up, so to speak, 
because quite often when you put your pieces down on your workbench, move them around, you'll flip them over once in a while and you don't want to attempt to try to apply them in the wrong orientation or on the wrong side. Right here you'll see I have a piece of 1 MDF. I get this from a place up in Ottawa called KJP Hardwoods or Select Hardwoods. They've got a lot of great products there and it's the only place so far that I've found that I can find 1 MDF. I think it's an excellent material to use for templates and since the Logox brand name is going to be cemented or attached directly to my pine backer, I need a template in order to make sure that my letters are oriented and spaced correctly. So in this case, there's nothing to engrave or nothing to score. I needed a template. You can certainly find a number of packs of craft board or MDF type material or cardboard on Amazon. But the challenge is you usually have to buy them in packs of 50 or more. And I have not yet found any type of an offering that has a size of 12 by 20, which is the work bed on my laser. The largest one I've found so far is 11 by 17. And, and I'd rather not buy something that's not going to fit the bill. So the MDF I'm picking up from Ottawa at KJP, I believe it's, uh, I think it's 12 by 19, if I'm not mistaken. But it pretty much fits my entire bed. So that's why I pick it up from up there. As you've seen me do before, once I have all my pieces out, I want to peel the backs off to get them ready for glue, but I also want to do a quick dry fit. This ensures that I haven't lost any pieces, especially the few smaller pieces there, whether they're in the bottom tray of the laser or they've fallen on the floor, and it makes sure that I have a nice tight fit and everything is accounted for and it's ready for glue. All looks good. I've got everything there. I think it's time to call it a day and hit the sack. And then in the morning, we'll get together and we'll start gluing. Bright and early in the morning with a cup of coffee, I'm going to start gluing. I've been testing different ways of applying or cementing or gluing different acrylics together or acrylics in wood. Uh, CA glue works excellent. I've got this number 16 cement, it's called, which I've shown you folks in the past. And the Weld On 4, I'm getting much better with it now that I've started using a syringe to apply it. What I've found works really well so far is I'll often put a few dabs, small dabs of that number 16 cement, or I may use the Starbond thick CA glue. And that's just to allow it to give it some adhesion so that it holds it in place. And then I'll come back afterwards, as you'll see here, with a syringe and the weld on number four. Probably the Starbond or the number 16 cement is probably enough to cement it or glue it together, but I just, don't want anybody calling me in six or eight months saying, hey, a letter fell off. So I use that glue just to kind of tack it in place. That way I don't have to worry about trying to hold the piece in place while I'm trying to use the syringe with the weld on. It's already there or tacked, so to speak. And now I can come back with full confidence and then apply my weld on with the syringe. And the weld on, as you know, literally melts the two pieces of adhesive or the two pieces of acrylic together. And I think that's going to give you long-term quality to any of the pieces you're doing for your customers. So that being said, that finishes the first part of this video or the beginning of the video. I have all my acrylic work completed. I have my standoffs ready. I've done all my gluing and my welding. And now I can leave that piece to sit for the next day or so before I begin to apply it or put it together with the pine backer. So now we can set that aside and start work on our geometric background using pine. So we're gonna build our backboard or a geometric wall art. Went over to Home Depot and I got myself a half inch piece of plywood, two foot by two foot. I knew I was gonna need at least a half inch because I don't have a 23 gauge nail gun. I have an 18 gauge and the shortest brads I could get were five eighths of an inch. So I knew I needed at least that thick of backer. Took it to the table saw and I cut out my 18 by 19 inch sign. The backboard. This is our best friend during this project. Like any woodworking project you do, you want to make sure your foundation is square. You have to start off square. So you want to make sure after your cuts that you check all sides, make sure that your pieces and your cuts are perfectly square. It's going to make the rest of your project so much easier. For my backer or my geometric design, being my first or second time doing it, I didn't want to spend a lot of money on maple or walnut or cherry or anything like that. 
and then bring pieces back and have to try to cut them down on the table saw. But I did find lattice at Home Depot. These are four foot lengths. It's simple pine lattice that you see probably on the top of some of your fences or your neighbor's fences around your decking. They sell them in big bundles of 50 for $32 Canadian. And it's nice wood. They're reasonably consistently cut. They're about a four feet long. They're an inch and a half wide and they're about three eighths of an inch in thickness. And in the pack, you're gonna find, you know, some have far too many knots in them. Some might have cracks on the end, but hey, for that price, it's pine. And it just means, given that they're rough cut, that you're just gonna have to do a little more sanding than you would have otherwise. But you can fancy them up and make them look really pretty. That's what we'll use for a geometric pattern. With my piece cut out and nice and square, I'm gonna estimate how many of these pieces of lattice I'm gonna need, or these pine boards. And then I begin using an 80 grit, and I eventually go to a 120 for now. We'll come back to this later just to get that kind of rough cut finish off of it and get it a little bit smoother than it was. So I've got a rough sand on my lattice. I'm gonna grab my plywood and I'm gonna find the exact middle of the board and give myself a line. Knowing that my lattice strips are approximately one and a half inches each or reasonably consistent of that, I'm just gonna measure three quarters of an inch on either side and I'm gonna give myself a guide there with the pencil. That'll let me know where to glue my spine, I'll call it, in place. We need to get the spine in place and firm before we go any further. So I'll cut my piece here, bring it back, and I'm gonna glue it into place. I've always found that if you glue both sides of each, in other words, glue on either piece of wood, it's gonna adhere much better. And you know, using your finger to spread it out a bit never hurts. Once I measure that up, I'm gonna throw a few brads into there just to keep it in place. You may also have noticed that I cut the piece longer than the dimension of my plywood. And I'll show you why shortly. You don't wanna to try to cut it exactly to fit. With my spine in place, so to speak, I'm gonna flip my compound miter saw to 45 degrees and I'm gonna leave it there for the rest of the project. Basically, all we're doing now is cutting 45s, one after another. I'm gonna place my first piece in there as an anchor piece, glue it down, and I'm gonna throw a few brads in there to hold it. I've done, I do that now on both sides of my spine. That way I have a stable piece or an anchor to add all the rest of my pieces. And literally, they're just 45s, one after another. I know on some of the tutorials you'll see, uh, people may suggest that you cut all of your angled pieces totally mark them out on your board, number them one to 50 or whatever, and then do all your gluing at once. Because this was a smaller piece, I didn't see a need for that. I think with the more complex pieces, you may find that handy. But for this piece, I've got a firm spine. I have my two starter pieces on either side and I've measured them down from the top. And all I need to do now is just cut, glue, and nail. This is what your piece should look like when you're done. As I mentioned earlier, you don't wanna to try to fit every piece exactly to fit. You wanna let them overlap the size of your plywood backer, at least by an inch or two. And here's why. Now I'm gonna take that piece, flip it over. I'm gonna put a guide in place and clamp it down so that I can run my skill saw blade exactly down the edge of plywood. And you'll see what happens. You get a nice, clean, straight cut. Everything is perfectly lined up. And given that I'm not a master craftsman or carpenter, this always works best for me because if I tried to cut every piece to exactly fit, I'm pretty sure I'd cut a few short and a few too long. This allows me to cut everything off nice and square. And 
this is what she looks like when it's done. With that part of the project done, I'm just going to grab a simple piece of trim here. I believe this was a 5 8 inch piece because I just wanted to frame up the edges to hide the plywood and to clean it up and make it look a little prettier. And this was just a simple job of measuring out my four sides, cutting 45s again, and then gluing and fitting and nailing that frame in place around the piece. And there you have it. All of my saw work is complete, so I'm going to grab a little bit of filler and I'm going to fill all my nail holes. I keep a damp cloth handy and you'll see I just dampen my finger on the cloth and I use it to wipe or to apply that wood filler. I find that if you use a putty knife, you end up usually often putting way too much on the piece and that of course increases the amount of sanding you have to do afterwards. Your finger usually will give you enough to dab in there and to fill those holes more than adequately and that way you have less material to have to sand off afterwards. Once that filler is dried properly, we'll take her outside and we'll begin sanding. This is an important step in the process here, this final sanding with a higher grade or a finer sandpaper. I need to make sure that the face of my pine is level and square, so to speak. Because in this particular case or with this design, I'll be putting acrylic glued directly onto the pine and you don't want too many high spots or low spots because then the acrylic is not going to sit flush or level on top. So I make sure I bring out our old friend the square and I check it from time to time to make sure that I've taken all the high spots out of those pieces of pine and I've got a nice flat level surface so I can later glue my acrylic to it. Our sanding is complete. I used a little compressed air and a damp cloth just to get rid of any remaining sand or extraneous sand or dust. I'm going to set it up now. And in this particular case, I decided to stain this wood. I always make sure to use a pre-stain. It makes a big difference in the outcome of your piece. You'll see here I've used just a, a throwaway brush to apply the pre-stain and I've also used that to apply the stain. On the second piece, I decided to give it a shot and just use a microfiber cloth, a paint cloth, and I found that the stain took and the piece turned out much better using a cloth than with these foam brushes. I finish applying my pre-stain, I follow the directions, and then you'll see I've used a microfiber cloth to clean off any excess before it dries too much. Now it's time to stain. Because my bull is a dark color, it's black. I wanted to make sure I didn't use any type of a deep or a dark stain because I wanted the bowl to kind of pop on the design. So I used a white stain, it's called linen. And again here you'll see I've applied it with a brush, I give it its time and then I wipe it off with a cloth, any extra, before it begins to dry too much. After everything is dried and ready to go, I'm going to finish it off just with a water-based finishing. I'm not a big fan of the oil based because I find that no matter what wood you use, you always end up with some kind of almost like a yellowing effect after you've applied the finish. So I prefer a water based finish because it always dries clear. No yellowing, no discoloration. Okay, so we're almost there my friends. Everything's dried, I've cured it, we're ready to go and put the sign together. I'm going to use my template, measure it out. I'm going to tape it down and then in this particular case because I'm applying acrylic to wood I decided to use the star bond thick it works great for this type of an application you'll see I've also placed my bowl and I'm making a mark where I'm going to need to drill holes and apply my standoffs
my letters are in. These standoffs can add an awesome dimension to your signs. It gives it that almost 3D effect and also allows you to layer pieces on top of each other to highlight them. I've only used a number of different sizes up to about three quarters of an inch in width, but here's how I apply them and here's how I've learned. They're all pretty much similar to this. The cap will unscrew from your base. You're going to need to do holes in your design somewhere to support that second layer. And so the way I determine the size of my hole is I'll take my calipers and I'm going to measure the diameter of the base and I'm going to write that down and then I'm going to take a measurement of the diameter of the screw itself. And then what I want to do is make sure that I add a little bit of width to the diameter of the screw, but not so much that it comes too close or exceeds the diameter of the base because you don't want the rounded corners of your hole to peek out of the sides of your standoff. You want it hidden totally underneath the cap like this. The reason why you want to make your hole or your cutout just a tiny bit bigger than the width of the screw is because you want to give yourself a little bit of flexibility, but not so much that you exceed the outside diameter of the standoff itself. That way you've got a little bit of room to play with in the event that you accidentally missed your mark by, you know, a half a millimeter, or you just need that comfort of ensuring that the acrylic is not under pressure against the screw. The next thing I learned as well is that you don't want to use a round headed screw. You need a flat headed screw. If you use a round headed screw, you'll find that it takes away space inside the barrel. And in the event that you take up too much space, you won't be able to screw the cap down very tightly on the acrylic and the acrylic will be loose. So you want to stick with a flat head screw. And lastly, at least the standoffs that I've used to date, you're going to find that the hole in the bottom will not accommodate a number eight screw very well. So you need to get yourself number six screws. And then of course, whatever depth or length that you need for the particular piece. When you're dealing, especially with thin, soft materials, such as this pine, it's always helpful to drill a pilot hole before you screw into it. That way you'll minimize any chance of it splitting under the screw. We're simply going to screw in our standoffs, get them in place. I'm going to peel back my aux, get that ready to go, and then begin removing all of the, ex the excess protective layers or films off of all of the acrylic. We'll place our bowl, finish screwing in all of our standoffs, and finish peeling off all our letters. And there's what the initial sign looked like. So that's a wrap. There's the finished product for number two. I've already shipped the first one and I'll get this ready to ship tomorrow. I'm really pleased with the way it turned out. And now that I've kind of got a little bit of experience doing these geometric patterns, I'd like to give a little more of a complex one a try. Or maybe using some of these, what they call exotic woods for highlights, because I can pick those up from KJP up in Ottawa as well. Thanks for sticking around. I hope you did find this informative and helpful. And if you haven't tried doing these geometric patterns or mixing the woods with acrylics, I'd offer that you should give it a shot if you have the opportunity. It does add a lot more character and a lot more depth to your piece. Gives it a little more of a, uh, a rich look, I guess you might call it. And I'm really pleased with the way it turned out. Thanks for sticking around. Have a great week with your families and please be kind to one another. And I'll see you again right here. I'm Gord Potter. And you've been watching LaserNug. Cheers.